Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for, uh, for blessing and providing for this ministry, Lord, for Pastor Izzy and Jan, Lord, for all that you've accomplished, all the lives that you've touched. Lord, we pray that you'd even continue that work this morning, Lord, for each of us that are listening, and that we would draw ever closer to you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that just as that breeze is blowing off the ocean, Lord, that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would fill us to overflowing, Lord, that you would touch our lives. We'd walk away here this morning changed drawing closer to you, Lord, that we can be used uh, amazingly uh, in your good works, Lord, for throughout mm-hmm. this coming week. We ask you to use Pastor Jesus now to bless him, Lord, to encourage him, to feed your sheep through him. We ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and go to verse, we got to verse 33 last week, where we ended, uh, we'll pick up there this morning. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. We've got a few of the Bibles over here that the Lord blessed us with from the Gideons. We're so grateful for their ministry and their help. In fact, we have Bill here who has been one of our big time helpers in the Gideon and Aaron and uh, getting Bibles out to the community. So, you know, the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The Word of God. So we have the Word of God, and I say with like a little w, the Word, the, the scriptures that testify of the big W capitalized. What's the big W word of God? Jesus. Jesus said, I, I, uh, he, he was the word in John chapter 1 that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And, and he's the one that shows us the way to the Father. And so this morning we're rejoicing because Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. For those of you that haven't been with us, the, the background is Corinth was a, a, a church that Paul actually pastored. He planted it. He, uh, as a missionary, on one of his missionary journeys, he went through Corinth, and he wound up staying there a year and a half. Planted the church, led the people to Christ, um, helped them grow in the Lord. And Corinth, for those of you that don't know, Corinth back then was the uh, sin city of, of the Mediterranean. We'll just put it that way. It was kind of like the Las Vegas of their day. You know, it was, um, had, a, had a lot of the carnal things going on. And... God put this little church as a light in a really dark place. But they had questions, just like all believers. They were growing. They wrote to Paul some of their concerns. They wanted to know about certain things. And so this letter, Paul is really answering, you know, their, what they asked about. You know, like, one of the, we're going to see today, one of the questions has to be about what will our heavenly body be like? You know, are we going to have bodies in heaven? We, we know we have spirits and we have bodies down here, but what's it going to be like? And have any of you had to field this question, by the way? Maybe you had a grandchild or a, a, a child going, are we going to have bodies in heaven or what's it going to be? You know, and they have all the, I love kids' questions. I, I got introduced to ministry in children's ministry. By the way, that was just warm up for you guys. It was because, um, you know, the truth is the kids have the same questions. The parents have them too. The parents are just too cool to ask. Kids are not. They'll go, we don't get it. <laughs> Pastor Riz, what does this mean? And, and so this is one of my favorite passages, the part we're coming into, about what will, we, what will our heavenly body, any of you thought about this? What will your heavenly body be like? You think it's going to be like this thing? You know, I don't. I mean, hope not. Amen to that. Hope not. <laughs> we're going to get upgraded. Okay? That I know because, we're, well, I'll take you to a few passages in just a minute. But Paul likens this body that we're in as a tent. In 2 Corinthians, he calls this, chapter 5, a tent that, that, you know, tents are good for a while, camping out, but you don't want to stay permanent. But then he refers to the, the body that God is going to make for us in heaven. Now, remember Jesus said, don't worry in John 14, 6, I go to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many what? Mansions. Well, Paul Paul, he, he caught on to what um, Jesus was saying, and he says that this body is a tent. That body that God makes for you is a, likened to a mansion, upgraded. I mean, we're talking big. I don't know about you, but I think, all right, 
it's going to be, I'm going to be much better looking anyway when we get there. And you won't recognize me and be like, that's Izzy? But, um, but th see, I read in Revelation that it says he will put his name on our, on our foreheads. We will, be, we will be his, we will be called his sons, his daughters. We'll be his family. I mean, like, literally, for ones that didn't come up with good family life in this world, this gives me such great hope. Or for ones that are in the orphanages, I tell them, listen, you will, no, you will never be orphaned for eternity. For eternity, you're going to belong to God's family. The book of Revelation tells us that in the words of Jesus himself. So you got, you got on good authority that you're going to be adopted by the king. The king of all kings is going to make you part of his family. And when he does, he's going to take this humble earthly body that's clothing your spirit right now, and he's going to upgrade it to a heavenly body. And this is what the part Paul is getting to. Now, Paul had just explained, if we were Christians that believed that Christ rose from the dead, how many of you believe Jesus rose from the dead anyway? Christ is risen. What's your answer? He is risen indeed. Let's try it again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Pentecostals. Okay, ready? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, right. So, hallelujah. So, he is he is risen. And Paul said, if he wasn't risen, the part we just finished last week, if he wasn't risen, we'd be most to be pitied. Because if he didn't rise, then we don't rise. I mean, that's, there you go. But the truth is, he did rise. And we have, Paul just went through all of the things that the scriptures testified that he would rise, all the witnesses that saw that he had risen from the dead, and he even confirms it with him last of all, he said, as one untimely born, Christ showed himself resurrected, after the resurrection, to me when he was killing Christians. That's when the Lord appeared to him and converted him from Saul of Tarsus to Paul, the apostle. And then the Lord got a hold of him and he, he began to teach these guys, listen, Christ has risen. And just like any good pastor, talking about the resurrection, you know, guys, the resurrection has such an impact on our Christian walk. Such a powerful message. And just like Christ is risen, Paul's going to lead into, so we will be risen with him, and we'll have new heavenly bodies. But before he gets to the heavenly bodies, we ended on verse 33. Would you look back at it with me? As we pick up today, I just want you to know, he's a good pastor. He slips in a little admonition, word of encouragement. He said, do not be deceived. We went over this to end our sermon last week. Don't be deceived. Bad company does what? Corrupts good morals. Now he's in the middle of a discourse about resurrection of Jesus. He's leading into, I, I'm telling you where he's going, into resurrection of us in our heavenly bodies. And in between he slips in, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Why did he do that? Think about their culture. Did they have bad company around there in, the, in Corinth? Oh, yeah. I mean, it'd be like writing to the church at Las Vegas, and you tell them all about Jesus' resurrection. Yep, Christ rose, and you're going you're gonna, to, he had a new heavenly body, and you're, you're going you're gonna to rise and have that new heavenly body. It's great. This is all good. And by the way, don't be deceived. Got to slip that in there. Because did he know that church? Did he know the community they were in? Did he know the pressures that come against the gospel? When you preach the resurrection from the dead to people, you have pressures from the flesh trying to deceive people into thinking, well, you know, so I hang out with some bad people. What's the big deal? They need some light. Have you ever heard that? The, 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 the brother comes to me, he says, Pastor, I'd like you to pray for me. I've, I've been struggling with alcoholism for 15 years. But, you know, my friends, they're really in dark, and I'm a new Christian, so I'm going to go to the bar with them <laughs> and be a light at the bar. And I tell him, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. How about drag that person to church instead of you go to the bar with them? Because, you know, it's such a trap when we learn of the gospel message of the resurrection, to think, well, it won't really matter if I hang out with the bad company now. Because I'm, Christ is risen, I'm going to rise. And yet Paul knew it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work for our faith to take the things, you know, Jesus said, come 
Come out, be ye separated. Be ye, another spiritual word, four letters. Guess what it is? Holy. Be ye holy. Be separate from the ways of the world. You're in this world, Jesus said, but you're not what? Of it. You're in it, but you're not to be of it. And I use the example since I'm a teacher and I have visual aids. Everyone look out there. See the nice, see the boat over there? I got that one. Or there's an extra one over there, a few more, just for visual aids. Those boats are made to be in the, in the water, right? Designed to be in the, in the ocean. The only problem for a boat is what? When you get the ocean into the boat. You were made to be in this world as a Christian. You're just not made for the world to be in you. It'll sink your boat. You put too much of the world in you. You put too much bad company in your lives. Don't be deceived. You, it'll corrupt you. It'll take you down. It'll sink you spiritually. And that's Paul. Here he's talking about this glorious topic of resurrection. And he's like, I don't want anyone to get sucked back, you know, and miss the, the big picture. But we do. We get deceived. We get sucked into bad company, and then we think it's not going to matter. And it does. It drags you down. We know, you know, for the older ones, who can give an amen? Does this happen? You ever tried it? You know, I'm just going to just hang with them for a little while. I'll try to keep them in. And, and you, feel your, you feel your very soul getting, getting vexed, drugged down. There's one more word of admonition before he goes on to our heavenly body topic. Look at verse 34. Then he says, Become sober minded as you ought to sober mind not so he's not telling you sober of uh, alcohol sober he's talking sober of mind he says and stop sinning Do you know the mind can be drunk on stuff that's not from the alcohol i mean you can be drunk on any sin whatever it is that 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 takes over you just like well since i grew up with a mom that drank a bit i know about alcohol taking over it's a sad thing when it happens to a person where they cannot, the alcohol begins to rule their lives. But any sin can rule your lives. And Paul is like, stop it. Be sober-minded. Sober up, man. Stop sinning. <laughs> Do you think you actually have to preach that at church to Christians? What a topic. I think, I mean, he's, he's writing this to the church at Corinth. How do you think they're, can you, if they had listened to him preach for a year and a half, you know, have any of you listened to some preacher for a while in your life and then you, you have someone say, oh, I heard J. Vernon McGee on the radio, the Bible bus, and he said, uh, you know, you need to stop sinning. Be sober-minded. That was pretty good. I, I can't know. I always, uh, that voice he just has, it gets you, you know. But you know, when you hear someone preach a message, uh, you've heard their preach enough, it's like you can hear them, you can actually, when you just see the words, you can hear it in their voice. I bet you the Corinthian church was just sitting there going, yep, the guys that are reading. And Paul said, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And they're all going, yeah, I can hear Paul saying that. And become sober-minded as you ought to. Stop sinning. For some of you, he says, has no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Man, you know, today, politically correctness of how you talk. You have to be careful, you know. Step on people's toes. You, you said, you sinners. Uh, I didn't say you all are sinners. I said all of us are sinners. Right? We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Paul would tell you, stop sinning. Man, how many, how many messages have you actually heard on Christian radio today or, you know, as you're listening through sermons that you hear the pastor actually say, stop it. Stop sinning. Now, should we stop sinning? Is it a good idea? Yes. Yeah. Because what's the wages of sin? Death. Death. Jesus said, I came to give you life, to give it to you more abundantly. But if you want to live in sin... And think it's going to bless your life. You're, you're deceived. Don't be deceived. Today's message, the first part, is all for you. Don't be deceived. Stop sinning. Before I can tell you about heavenly bodies, this is a really important. I probably shouldn't skip. I was going to skip over and go to the heavenly bodies, maybe tie back to this. But you know, some of you fall asleep in a little while, and I don't want you to miss it. 
So I hear about people's attention span keeps narrowing and narrowing with this gadget age that we got going on. I got to get into points right away. Before you fall asleep, stop sinning. Okay? The Lord wants you to have knowledge of Him. And when you sin, it dulls your ear to hearing the things about the Lord. It dulls your, your like, pers doesn't it, Bill? It, like, makes people where they got, like, lend a, kind of like a clouded veil over their eyes. They, they don't, you'd be going, and the Lord just did this great thing for me. I feel so blessed. And they'd be like, I don't see it. I don't see no blessing. And what's the big deal? You know, and you're like, no, it's a big deal. The Lord did this cool thing. And you can see it clear as day. But, you know, when someone's in sin, it, it puts a blinders over their eyes, and they don't see clearly. And I have a feeling it was going on in the Corinthians. Well, I know it was because I read 2 Corinthians and actually finished out this book too. And you're going to find there's a guy in the church going to the Corinthian church who is sleeping with his father's wife and going, it's okay. It's all love. Paul has to write him and say, tell that guy, stop sinning. And if he doesn't listen to him, put him out of the church. And they do put him out of the church, by the way. Who can tell me, did it work? Yes. yes. In fact, it worked, but the church was so full of rules, they're like, and he can't come back because he was sinning. No, he repented, and what did Paul write in 2 Corinthians? Take him back. The whole reason you correct someone is to, to get him back on the right track. I love that the Lord loves us enough to correct us. Don't you? I mean, he keeps me on the straight and narrow because he knows the curves, those little crooks in the, in the, in the wiggly road, they got those pitfalls, those real steep ravines, you know, those sheer cliffs you can fall. And, and the Lord's going, not that way here. Let me put a guardrail here. Let me put some crazy pastor on the beach to tell you, stop, go back, get on the right straight, straight and narrow, get over. Oh, no, 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 not that way, this way. What's a good shepherd do for the sheep? Leads them. In the right way. And you know, Paul cared about these people at Corinth, and he's like, stop sinning. It's not doing you any favors. You got to be sober minded. Wake up. Make your mind sober. Don't be deluded. Don't be polluted by sin. Don't let it creep in. It will affect all the, your whole outlook. It can, and sin can be like, some people are like, well, you're just talking like what? Big things like, you know, what? Adultery or fornication or. Killing, something like that. It, 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 how many sins does it cover? Well, all of them, right? I mean, it could be a lie. It could be a, 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 a you, you know, looking on a woman, it says in the scripture, Jesus said, if a guy looks on a woman with lust in his heart, it's like he committed. All. We're talking, it's down to the matters of the heart. But I say to you, the good Lord wants us to walk right, sober of spirit, sober. And this, he says, I, some people don't have any knowledge of God. Now, he's writing to the church, so he's not writing, he's not writing this to the, to the people that don't go to church. He's writing to the people that go to church, and he says, some people don't have knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Who's he speaking it to? To the church. In other words, if they're supposed to have knowledge of God, who's supposed to be giving them the knowledge of God? We are. We should be going, it's the... Sounds like church might be starting up next door. Kona, what is it? Kona United Methodist next door. Praise the Lord. I felt solo for so long. Now I got an extra church right on next door. Maybe make this church row. Can you just picture churches all the way up in? Man, that would be so cool. I know you. People are like, oh no, aren't you worried competition? Are you kidding me? Look up, Jesus said, the, we, the fields are what? White for harvest. There are so many souls that need this message. And he says, I speak it to your shame that they don't know about me yet. We should make sure everyone knows about the Lord and what he's done. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.